Now our new history programme, Witness, where eyewitnesses to world events tell their stories. Today, a hostage remembers the 444 days he spent in captivity. It's 1979, six months after the Iranian revolution has swept the Shah from power. November 4th started out as a dreary, rainy day, but it was a day like any day in Tehran. There were marches going on all the time. You hear noises in the street and you hear Marg Bar Amrika, death to America or down with America. Barry Rosen was press attaché at the U.S. Embassy. At about 10 in the morning, I heard noises outside, looked at the window. A group of hardline students were climbing over the fences of the embassy, and before I knew it, they were trying to pound on the door, and they did pound on the door. And my secretary, her name was Mary, I told her, no, don't open the door. Hold out as long as possible. I had no idea what my next move would be. Everything was so fast. And then more and more and more of these young men with pictures of Imam Khomeini fastened to their chests with pins. And the rain was coming down. And Mary finally opened the door. Bang! A flood of these young angry men with clubs. And they said, you're a member of the nest of spies in Farsi. Lane Josu's son. And I said in Farsi, I'm the press attaché of the United States of America. In the United States, President Jimmy Carter was furious. It's vital to the United States and to every other nation that the lives of diplomatic personnel and other citizens abroad be protected and that we refuse to permit the use of terrorism and the seizure and the holding of hostages to impose political demands. The students demanded that the Shah, who was being treated for cancer in the New York hospital, be returned to Iran to stand trial. Inside the embassy, they rounded up the American staff. They stood there for a second, and then they grabbed me, they tied my hands, and then they brought me and the rest of, the, of my staff over to the library. They started to question me about my role in front of everybody. And all the Iranians were crying, all my people were crying. And then they pulled out a gun. And I said, wait, guys, let these people go. Do what you want with me, but let them go. You know, a lot of adrenaline was rushing through my veins. I just don't know what, what, why I was saying these things. And with some negotiations, they freed every one of them, but they took their names so that they could interrogate them some other time. That was one of the most touching moments at that time because everybody started crying. We started to kiss each other, and I said goodbye, and I meant goodbye. I really meant that this was the end. You must have been terrified. Well, there's no word for it. Your entire body tingles. You conjure up every possible last moment of your life and possibly things that you could have done. I was absolutely more than terrified. I don't, I don't even know if there's a term that can be used. On the streets, there was huge support for the students. Crucially, they also got the backing of the supreme leader, Ayatollah Khomeini. Amid popular fears that the US wanted to reinstall the Shah, the 52 American hostages were seen as insurance against any US plot. Masumer Ebtekar was spokeswoman for the students at the embassy and went on to become Iranian vice president. When the Shah was admitted to the United States, the students were quite confident that there's something going on behind the scenes. They intended to protect the integrity of their country, their independence, and I think that they achieved, to some extent, what they intended. In the United States, President Carter froze Iranian assets, but months passed, negotiations failed. Pressure on Carter mounted. In March, a video emerged of the American hostages, including Barry Rosen. His mother, back in New York, was moved to speak out. I didn't recognize my son. His arms are like sticks. He could barely pick them up. 
and something happened to his eyes, his face. He's so worn out, so tortured looking, and so thin. <laughs> President Carter, this is my plea to you as a mother to a father. Not as a president, but as a mother to a father. Please listen to my plea. <laughs> my husband is gone, but I want my son back. Barry is fading away. Please help me. President Carter did finally launch a rescue bid. Late yesterday, I cancelled a carefully planned operation which was underway in Iran to position our rescue team. It had ended in failure. Rescue helicopters had broken down en route. Aircraft collided over the Iranian desert, killing eight U.S. servicemen. Back in Tehran, the interrogations had not stopped. I was brought downstairs, and they, in a theatrical manner, had everybody standing there, about six or seven guards, all with masks on and automatic weapons. And my interrogator said, I want you to sign this admitting to your spying. And I said, no. And he said, I'm going to count from 10 to 1, and if you don't sign it, I'm going to blow your head off. 10 seconds is a long, long time. And they counted and counted, and I said to myself, as they get to 5, I don't want to die. I can't see how the, the government's going to hold this against me. I you know, wanted to be perceived as being as patriotic as possible for whatever reason. But by the time they got to two, I certainly said, yep, I'm signing. That drained the hell out of me. When they brought me back to my cell, I was out of it for a long time. But he says the worst part of his ordeal was that there was no end in sight. It was just a certain sense of agony, and I think somewhere in my brain I gave up. I couldn't sleep. My entire nervous system was on an alarm system. Every time I tried to sleep, something would wake me up and, and say, stay alert, stay alert. And I, you know, in retrospect, I always look at it and I say, yeah, that was my head saying to me, you're going to die. But if you're up, they can't kill you. How, how do you cope? You know, um, to be perfectly truthful, I would have liked to have, have killed myself. And there were some of my colleagues who tried to bang their heads against cement walls in the prison or even cut their wrists. I wanted to die. Every day I woke up, the sun rose, I said, oh no, another day here, here. I could remember that every day a little spot of light would come into the, this dark cell and it would move, move from the top of the ceiling all the way to the bottom. So that was about two hours just watching that spot move. Sounds silly, but you know, you had to take anything you could get. After 444 days in captivity, Barry Rosen and the other 51 hostages were released, just hours after Jimmy Carter was succeeded as president by Ronald Reagan. The Shah himself had died months earlier in July 1980. Years later, Barry Rosen agreed to meet one of his captors. As he tried to come to terms with his experience, it was worth it, he said. We saw each other as humans.